I would like you to react to this report suggesting the exit of multinational companies in Nigeria. You know, it's alarming and it's disturbing because some of these uh, multinational companies, they are into uh, goods and services that are of necessity to the nation. How do you react to this kind of news and what are the factors you think are responsible for this kind of exodus? Well, um, it's not a good news. It's a disturbing news. We are not happy about it, particularly as a stakeholder in the uh, MSME sector. And um, to us, it is a situation that the government needs to begin to get concerned about and look at how they can mitigate against further exits of these multinationals from our country. There are so, so many issues that are uh, of concern to those who have left and those who are, who are also thinking of leaving the country. Uh, some of it is because of the forest issues that we have. Quite a number of these manufacturing companies have difficulty accessing forex. They have difficulty accessing forex, and forex is used to get their input, their equipment to the country for their production processes. For others, manufacturing country, they also need forex to repatriate their profit back to their mother country. This has not been possible because of inavailability of forex, and you know, multinationals will not want to go to the black market. In fact, the black market may not have the volume of a, a dollar that they will need for their transactions. Another challenge has been the issue of um, of power. Power has been a big, big challenge. Now that subsidy is fully removed, it's difficult to run uh, operations on diesel generator alone. Uh, it, it, it will have been cheaper and easier to have uh, power supplied by electric government electricity, but you know power has been unavailable and been erratic, and it is also becoming more expensive. And that's one big issue that is affecting uh, manufacturers particularly the multinationals in the country. We also have the issue of insecurity. Insecurity is everywhere. Some of them sell their products to far north where there is a serious insecurity and that's mitigating against business and eroding their profits. And that's a big one. Inflation too is another challenge that um, quite a number of these multinationals have complained about. The cost of uh, raw materials is going up on a daily basis. And by the time this cost is being put down to the throat of the consumers. The consumers also have less processing power. It means they have to sell less of what they used to sell before, and that means less profit for them. And um, some of these companies has uh, targets to meet with, in terms of sales, in terms of profits, and when this is not met, uh, it, 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 it impacts negatively on their performance, and at times it may lead to their exit. And that's so, some of the reason why these companies are exiting. Yeah, our infrastructure too is not too good. Uh, it's difficult now to connect interlands because many of the routes are bad. And these products move from uh, the urban cities to the interlands for sales. We also have the issue of, uh, we also have the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, corruption. Corruption is also another big threat to manufacturing. Many of these manufacturers find it difficult to deal with some government officials because um, uh, kick of kickbacks and the rest. The policies of some of these companies does not really support uh, kickbacks, PR, or whatever you call it in the name of corruption. These are some of the issues that are mitigating against business, and this is why some of them are leaving. Yes, we also have global issues that is causing uh, the, the exit or death of some of these companies, because uh, even if you look around other countries, you discover that um, they have also relocated from some other countries, not just Nigeria alone. But over here, we have uh, our perennial issues that has been there for many times, and government needs to begin to work about it. Policy issues also is another big issue. Government needs to uh, look at our fiscal policies and see how they can redress them to address the concerns of today. Some of the policies we have uh, does not um, uh, live in tandem with the realities of today. It has to be reviewed. Some of them has to be replaced and then um, let them help to increase ease of doing business. I think um, the ease of doing business should be a great concern to government now because uh, these are the people, the organizations, the industries that are housing jobbers. And when these companies are leaving, it means there will be more joblessness. And when there are more joblessness, of course, insecurity and crime will continue to increase. 
All right. According to um, a report, uh, 20,000, at least 20,000 jobs have been lost in about three years from the exit of 15 companies from Nigeria. You have read out a lot of reasons why some of these companies are leaving. But beyond job loss, what other effect is it having on the Nigerian economy? Yes, starting from the job loss, I think that uh, uh, figure of 20,000 has been very conservative. Uh, the figures uh, are far more, much more than that. And um, when we are talking of getting our youth more engaged, we should be concerned if there's any reason for, uh, for uh, companies to now be uh, uh, dropping their staff and increasing the, 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 the population of the job market. That's a big concern also. Uh, beyond the issue of job losses, we have um, uh, this concern that investors will become disenfranchised from wanting to bring their funds to Nigeria. It discourages investors from just choosing Nigeria as a destination point. The president and his team have been going around the country, advancing for investors to come to the country. But on the other hand, you discover that um, these investors also do their own uh, due diligence. They do their own investigation to see if it really the country is fertile enough for the investment. When multinationals are leaving, it gives a very negative signal to other investors that Nigeria may not be the best place to put their money, and that's not too good. If we want to increase our GDP, if we want to grow our economy, we need more investors in the country. Beyond that, too, like I did mention the other time, it also increases crime, because when these uh, jobbers lose their jobs, uh, it means that... Um, they just must find a way to means, make, make ends meet. One of the ways they will engage themselves in is illegal source of funding, when they could not get a legal source of funding. Some of these illegal source of funding may be crime and illegality. And that's why we see a lot of people go into uh, Yahoo Yahoo and uh, the Japan syndrome and the rest of it that is not good for our economy and for our brand as a nation. And uh, it should also be a serious concern. Another issue is the fact that uh, by the time this company leaves, technology also leaves with them. Many of these multinationals come with different technology from time to time, and our indigents here learn from them on a regular basis in internship and the rest. And when they leave, technology also lives with them. For us to grow our economy, we also need technology, modern up-to-date technology on how to do this, how to do that, how to process this and that. And they are one of the great source of technology in the country that uh, it's also a serious issue as they are living now with their different kind of technologies. We also have the uh, issue of um, of uh, support. Many of these companies give support at, in different forms of government. The first one is taxes. They pay taxes. Taxes increase the revenue of governments. They also do a lot of CSR, corporate social responsibility in different areas, particularly in their immediate communities. When they leave, that also lives with them. And um, that also is a negative indicator for us as a country. Now, let's look at the vacuum being created by the exit of these multinational companies. Don't you think this should be like a blessing in disguise for our local investors or the local companies who are here to take advantage of this vacuum to take up the challenge and also show their expertise? If this is the narrative, why do you think it's becoming a challenge too for the local entrepreneurs to take advantage of this vacuum? Well, it, ordinarily, it should have been, uh, it should have been uh, a plus for us, uh, locally, for our companies, our manufacturers, to take their space and grow better. But unfortunately, we are not prepared enough for it yet. We are not prepared enough for it. It takes a lot of fund and investment to house and have quite a, a, num a number of investment that these multinationals have put into place over the years. Some of them are 70, 80, 30 years in business in Nigeria, and they have expanded so much. They have a lot of resources, they have a lot of capacity that our local manufacturers do not have. And that being the case, it would take us some time to get there. So when they leave now, there are a lot of gaps. And um, you know that um, Nigeria is a consuming nation, 
it means that uh, if this company leaves and the man local manufacturers are unable to fill that gap, it will also begin to encourage more importation of some of these products and services that they render. We need government now to begin to see how they can build up the capacity of the local manufacturers to be able to fill the gap. And um, a lot has to be done with that. It's not a short-term project, it's a long-term project. And we may not be able to meet those needs at the immediate. So um, it's an advantage, but it is not what we are prepared for now. In the interim, that the small uh, businesses or the indigenous companies cannot fill the vacuum, it then means that this product that used to be, for instance, some product that used to be produced here will be imported. So it's, it's an opportunity for the importers. Yes, it's a big opportunity for the importers. It's a big, big opportunity for the importers. Like I did mention, um, quite a number of uh, the local manufacturers, micro, small, medium, and big, or that are local manufacturers, does not have the capacity to produce the number of products that these companies are shunning out. So it means there is now a gap to be filled, and it is going to be filled most likely by imported products. Also, too, is the fact that um, uh, it takes quite a, a lot of uh, work to get your product to certain standards. These multinationals have been able to bring their product in tandem with international standards in our market. Those that are in the micro small businesses have not been able to do that. And it will take also some time for them to be able to achieve this. And uh, that means that those that are already used to this kind of standard products, no matter what you tell them, may not want to come down the ladder to come and begin to patronize these less standard ones. Then that means they will also continue to fall back to the imported ones. And that's not what we should begin to preach or support in the country. We must now have a policy direction to address this challenge right and now so that um, we will mitigate those challenges and risks that comes along importation of this kind of products to our shores here in Nigeria. Now, let's talk about the ease of doing business. When you look at um, the last ranking, Nigeria is just below the ladder. Now, what are the challenges confronting, you know, having a proper business environment when it comes to ease of doing business in Nigeria? And how can these challenges be, you know, tackled for Nigeria to have a better rating when it comes to uh, ease of doing business? Well, the first has to do with the policy of governments. Uh, policy must be in tandem with the realities of the day. Uh, policies, I think, most often than not, are mismatched, and we have quite a number of policies, some are sold there and there, and then um, it has to be addressed. One best way to address these policies is for governments to see how they can engage stakeholders in the formulation, implementing, and co-owning of those policies. For example, in the manufacturing sector or in the MSME sector, if government must make policies, they must invite these critical stakeholders in this sector to be part of the policy. When government does policy on their own, there will always be gaps and it will bring in efficiency in the implementation and the monitoring of those policies. And that's one major problem that has been affecting us in the country at the moment. Uh, beyond that, too, uh, there is need for government to also see to it that um, there must always be an alternative for any major policy issues. For example, the issue of the removal of fuel subsidies. By the time removal of fuel subsidy came in, it drops our ranking in ease of doing business because it increases the it increases the difficulty of doing business. We would have expected that by the time a subsidy is to be removed, there will have been certain form of palliatives on ground, certain form of intervention on ground that will cushion the effect of the subsidy removal immediately. Yes, the government promised that there will be some intervention fund, but as, as we speak today, it's about eight or nine months down the lane, there is nothing that has been done. And um, it means that um, there's nothing to cushion that effect. And that continues to put do ease of doing business to a challenge in Nigeria. We also have uh, the issue of um, other indices, indicators that uh, does not support ease of doing business. Some of this is the issue of uh, Forex. Forex makes it very, very difficult to do, to do business in Nigeria now because most of our inputs, most of our 
equipments are still being imported. And when you do not have access to Forex or Forex is too expensive to purchase, then it becomes very difficult for you to do business. And that's one of the reasons why some of these companies, not just multinationals now, even the local companies are folding up. Statistics shows that about 20% of businesses have folded up in the last uh, two years. And that's not supporting ease of doing business. And they are all folding up because of these common denominators that we keep, we keep mentioning time and again and again. All right, let's look at standardization. Now, um, some companies may want to, some indigenous companies may want to uh, scale up or try to fill the vacuum. What can be done to ensure that what they do, what the service they render, the products that they produce are standard? Well, uh, good enough, we have regulatory bodies that um, ensure uh, that standards are being kept and met in Nigeria, particularly we have NAFDAQ, we have Standard Organization of Nigeria. But I must also let you know that um, uh, they do not have the enough human resources and capacity to ensure that standards are met in all the industries we have in the country. We have quite a number of uh, companies doing fake products and nobody is talking about them because nobody is even aware that some of these product companies are existing. The few ones that are being showcased on television or, or in the media are about one, two percent of those that are engaged in fake production. We also have those that are not even registered at all. They're not registered with NAFTA, they're not registered with SON, and they are in the business and they are flooding the market with their products. The, the, the resources, the human resources of some of these regulators are so low compared to the business activity in the country. For those who even submit themselves to regulation, how many of these companies are being checked and inspected time and again to ensure that the, the, the standard they, they, they say they have at the point of start is what they still confirm and comply to in the next one, two, three, four, five years in their production business. That's another challenge. Then even too, um, you discover that uh, when it comes to standard, it takes a lot of effort. Government needs to also see to it that the capacity of those in businesses to build them up to be able to meet with international standard is also part of government business. They must continue to uh, mark fund for capacity building trainings, workshop conferences to teach all these MSMEs how to build standards, how to maintain standards, and how to improve on the existing standard, and how to use technology also to improve the existing standard that they may already have had. This may not be possible for some of these MSMEs because they may not have the fund, but government is in charge and should be interested in growing the economy. And one way of doing so is building the capacities of these MSMEs to be able to achieve maximum standardization of their products. It is when these products are standard enough that they cannot compete with the international market, we cannot begin to talk of exports and they begin to end foreign exchange into the country and the ease the tension that we have in the forex market as at the moment. There is a, a, a UNDP $1 billion innovation fund uh, that uh, will be given to uh, Nigerian startups. In what way do you think that this will help as we look at expansion and even fill in the vacuum of the uh, multinationals that have exited the country? Well, um, that's a very good, um, a very good initiative in the right direction. In, for example, in our association, our slogan is start small and grow big. Uh, that's the best way to grow it. Even in nature, you start small and grow big. The best way to uh, improve our economy and grow the critical sector of this economy, which is the MSME sector, is to begin to encourage the startups, support them, it, it, and hold them, and give them all the necessary support they need to be able to grow, to become medium and large companies later. That's the way to go. So this initiative of this funding program to support startup, to me, is one of the best initiatives that we can have in our time. I am in support of it. I am proud of it. And I'm happy it is coming this time. However, the challenge that we always have over time when it comes to funding like this, particularly to startups, is that most times it doesn't really get to the real startups. We have the real startups. We have the political startups. 
people who are not really in business, but when funding programs are available, they come up and show themselves to be business owners. And at the end of the exercise, they get even more funding than those who are in the real sector. That's a big challenge that the government needs to address and the funders also need to address when it comes to funding startups. These startups are the vulnerable ones. They have very difficult challenge getting funds from the regular banks. They do not have collateral. They do not have all the way with that it takes to get funding from the regular banks. Also, to even if they have, the interest rate of the banks at the moment does not support startup businesses. And even the banks are also adverse for startups. So any alternative funding coming from other clients is a welcome initiative that will help us grow the startup in Nigeria. But another concern we have is that if we look at the startup hacks in Nigeria, it supports more of tech businesses, ICT businesses. And the kind of businesses we have in Nigeria supersede that of tech. At a deeper look, you discover that it also supports other businesses, but at technology driven. If we want to focus only on that. Can I go on? Please go ahead, you can hear you. Am I audible? Yes, you can hear you. Okay. If you want to focus only on tech driven businesses that are startups, a lot of uh, other businesses will be marginalized. Nigeria is still growing when it comes to technology. We have so many businesses that have not been able to imbibe technology as much as they should, but they also need some form of support and handholding. I do hope that this funding will go to those people or sector too, and not those that are addressed by just the startup acts of 2022 that we have in the operation at the moment. So if this is done, it's going to massively grow the startup industry. We have quite a number of our youths that are yearning to start businesses, but the major problem or challenge has been access to finance. So if this is coming up, it will help us to actually grow the startup sector. And it is a startup tech sector that will later matter more force to small businesses, to medium businesses, and eventually to large businesses. If we have enough indigenous large businesses in the country, we will not need to have these multinationals here. And if they leave, they will have little or no effect on us because the vacuum or the gap will not be there. All right. Now, let's look at something similar to this, which is the proposed uh, $200 million grant for SME startups in Nigeria, uh, which is what... Uh, the vice president talked about, you know, last week that um, women will be giving uh, the 50 percent proposal for women who are in businesses. What do you make of this kind of scheme, you know, and then what can be done differently? Because you raised a concern earlier that you have political SMEs. And I would like to know what's your association doing in this regard to hold government accountable because you're also part of the critical stakeholders in this sector. So what, what do you do to ensure that uh, you, you hold government accountable and then what can they do differently this time around so that the expected result is being achieved? Thank you. Uh, before I talk about what should be done differently, I was going to first of all commend the initiative to give 50% of this fund to women. Women are part of the very vulnerable sector we have and they need all the support that government or other institutions can give to them. The research shows that um, the funding we've had since 2013 till date, uh, most often than not, it is only 6% of women that are able to access those funds. That's a figure that is so low and is a cause for concern. And at the moment, we have uh, about 40% of businesses being owned by women. So if 40% of the the entire business owners can only accept 6%, then that's not good enough. So for us to have an initiative whereby the policy is that 50% of the fund will be a mark for women-led businesses, it's a good way to actually incentivize that sector and make them come to power with their male counterparts. And of course, women are good business owners. They are one of the highest rated when it comes to uh, loan repayments and uh, uh, loan commitments, which will eventually also grow our economy if we can grow the women-led sector. Now talking about how we can do it differently so that this fund will actually get to the women or to the youths or to startups for the other one that we mentioned before. One way we can do that is by ensuring that government works with the critical stakeholders. Uh, many of these businesses are registered with one form or the other of 
different business membership association or organizations that we have. Our home is one of such. We have been doing a lot of advocacy to government for the past three years now. We've spent so much time, energy, resources, and money to advocate to government that when you do any policy program or initiative towards this sector, carry the stakeholders along. For example, if you want to do funding for women or for startups, we would have expected governments to come through business membership organization to look at our data and see if we really have this sector in our data. Those who are really business owners that are women or that are youths or that are startups that should be able to benefit directly from this fund. The beauty of collaborating with stakeholders like our association, for example, is that we already have a big database for these people. We have already done a lot of profiling for them. We already have their KYC with us and a lot of information about them are already with us. And we will be able to monitor the funding, the implementation of the fund and the evaluation of what is done with the fund over time when it is being released. At the moment now, most times, government release money to so-called business owners, and that becomes the end. Nobody comes again to see, to, to ask questions. How was the money used? Was it used for its intended purpose? What is the success rate of the loan or grants or whatever it is? Uh, uh, what should be done differently based on the result and data generated from the research done on those that have been given the fund to? That has not been done at the moment and has not been done for a long time. But we believe that if there's enough collaboration with stakeholders, all of this will be achieved. Government will be able to have more data to work with. They'll be able to monitor and evaluate what is being done. And those results will help us to see if this kind of funding is actually the way to go or we should change the format or model that is being used or the methodology that has been used in future, and that will help us to get maximum result and efficiency from the fund that has been released. All right. So, for the women businesses or women led businesses that will benefit from this, are there particular businesses that you think should uh, be targeted with this fund? Um, I would have preferred that. The most vulnerable of the women-led businesses should be the one that would get in quite a, a, a sizable uh, 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 percentage of the fund. Uh, and these are those that are in nano and micro businesses. Nano and micro businesses form about 98% of the total businesses we have today, meaning about the 2% or 3% left are for those that are in medium and large businesses. So since this form the core of the businesses, the nano, the micro businesses are the core of the businesses we have, They're based on data that we have available to us in Nigeria, this fund should go to that sector. Incidentally, most of these uh, uh, players in this sector are most times, or uh, often they're not, not structured. They may not be very literate enough they are more or less either illiterate or semi-illiterate. So there must be a model that should be put in place to understand the needs of those in this category, the funding needs of those in this category, to be able to address those needs directly and to be able to ensure that these people are, have their capacity built to be able to use this fund efficiently and be able to pay back if it is a loan. Also, too, they should be able to uh, aggregate this sector in a way that they will be formed into different clusters, different based on the on their different nature of businesses, and this will help to ensure money, proper monitoring of the fund. Uh, if you ask me today, those that are into petty trading, those that are into uh, into artisan works, those that are, that are into uh, micro agriculture works, those that are into very small light manufacturing businesses, should be those that should get this funding at the moment. And these are the core businesses that are being done by those nano and micro sector. They are the ones that needs the fund the most.